Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Rocky Top Rewind podcast brought to you by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Check them out online at bluewatercliматecontrol.com or at blueh2o underscore climate. Glad to have you along with us talking about the return of David Cutcliffe and what it meant for Tennessee in the 2006 season. Tennessee gets it started off right against Cal and absolutely blowing out a Cal team 35 to 18. In rewatching this game, I'm reminded of how talented Cal was um, on the offensive side of the ball, and then I was reminded how poorly they were at the quarterback position and, and how well Tennessee played in this game. I mean, this was a totally different-looking Tennessee team from the last time Tennessee fans saw them uh, in 2005 when they, you know, beat Kentucky 27-8, to but it was just kind of a whole hum game, and the week before they had lost to Vanderbilt to close out 05. Just a total different vibe on an electric atmosphere uh, that was really set Austin with the opening to- or Rob with the opening tone on that kickoff when they knocked Craig Stevens out of the game. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that guy was a good player. You know, I mean, just I, I really – I mean, I knew Tennessee played well this night, but, I mean, going back and watching it, I mean, it, it, they were more dominant than I remembered, especially when you think about, you know, Cal having Marshawn Lynch – <laughs> of all people, you know, a guy who's who's been one of the most dynamic running backs in the NFL. And Justin life. Forsett. Yeah, I mean, it just Tennessee just dominated. I mean, on the ground, the push they got on on both lines of scrimmage. Eric Ainge, you know, completes 11 passes and, and has 291 yards. Thank you, Robert Meacham. Just, I mean, a, a phenomenal game. For, I got, that had to be Meacham's, you know, without going back and looking it up. It had, had to be his, the best game of his career. I mean, the takes a couple of short, you know, basically hooks and, and button hooks and, and turns them into 80-yard touchdown runs. I just, I mean, it was, again, I, I remember it being a big night. I didn't remember Tennessee being that dominant. I mean, a 35-18 to 18 score was misleading. I mean, Cal gets two of those touchdowns in garbage time against, you know, redshirt freshmen in the fourth quarter this it was it, it was a really fun rewatch i thought yeah a lot of fun names in this game whether it be marvin mitchell uh, inky johnson with the pick late in the game um you know and then my favorite my favorite you know ball tied in you know in the last you know post wit post wit chris brown i love chris brown you know and uh so yeah i thought that um you know that this was a, it was a fun rewatch and uh but Gerard Mayo was, you know, was really, really good on the defensive side of the ball. And then you're right. I mean, you know, it was a couple of simple passes where, you know, the defender made a bad, you know, play and, and you know, Meacham took it to the house. But then Swain had the, the bus for a touchdown. And we'll visit with Jason coming up later on in this podcast to talk about this 06 Cal game. But so much was talked about going into this game about the return of cut, Brent, and uh, – I think this was a perfect game to kind of just calm everybody's nerves coming off five and six in 2005 to win the way you did against a top 10 ranked team to start the season at home and to have the atmosphere you did and cuts return, I think kind of calmed the nerves for 06 and 07. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, I mean, for Tennessee fans, it was the return to normalcy. I mean, Tennessee looked like, and it's not a knock on Randy Sanders and, and the previous offensive staff there because they had had success. But as it was mentioned in the telecast, Jesse, Tennessee had gotten away from some of the detail stuff. And anybody that knows David Cutcliffe knows it's all about details for him or you don't play. I mean, he he doesn't play somebody who is short on details. And this was a team that was very dialed in, very focused, ready to pronounce themselves back in a season opening matchup that that was set up well for them. Cal was clearly not ready for the hornet's nest they walked into on that Saturday evening. Yeah, I mean, Tedford, I think, even admitted as much after the game. But you talked about this right before we started recording. I mean, the fact that Ainge has almost as many touchdowns in this one game as he had all the previous season, he clearly just had a a more uh, comfort or or just uh, feel for what David wanted him to do. Now, it helped in this game that that Cal couldn't tackle, you know, anybody. I mean (laughs) – Air. Yeah, I mean, it was like a peewee game, whether it was out on the perimeter with the wide receivers or whether it was Montario wasn't even running really hard on one play. And then, he, you know, he breaks four tackles for a touchdown. Looks like Tommy but, Frazier going down the sideline against the Gators. It was there, – there was, there was, that was also when one of the many times – Nestler had some hilarious quotes in this game, but he, he claimed that Charlie Garner could bench press 
over 400, 400 pounds. pounds. <laughs> I, I was, that was one. And then his, uh, after Mayo had a sack, his second sack, he's like, Gerard Mayo is going to send Longshore to the Mayo Clinic. I mean, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> So the announcers in this game were hilarious. And but, I totally, I've totally forgotten Paul McGuire was ever in the college booth. That one, that one caught me way off guard. Yeah, it, it was, but it was, it was a fun, it was a fun watch for sure. And I, and I agree with with Hubs's point that that was a hornet's nest that Cal uh, was not ready for. And, and I know they got you know some some redemption the next year. Longshore played much better in '07, um, but he was terrible in his second career start, obviously in this game. And that and Tennessee's defense just swarmed. But I thought that the fact that Cal had some – me Bain was on that defense. Hughes, I mean, they had some guys that got drafted fairly high, and yet Tennessee just seemed like they were so much more athletic on both sides of the ball than Cal. You know, this game, for everybody who, who reflects back on it, the, the thing they think is they think of the return of cut, they think about Meacham's big day, and, he, they, and rightfully so. But the thing upon rewatching is when you go look at it, and this was mentioned in the broadcast, Austin – you know, the new linebackers at Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee lost the previous year. Omar Gaither, who played in the league for several years. Yep. Kevin Simon, who was as heralded as anybody as a recruit. Now, he was hurt, you know, most of his career. But everybody knew how talented he was. They played Jason Mitchell with a torn ACL the previous year. And then they come in and they replace him with Ryan Carl, Marvin Mitchell, and Gerard Mayo. Okay, and, and, and Mayo is a guy who played forever in the league. Marvin Mitchell stayed with the Saints for a while. There was some linebacker depth in 05, and, and it showed up in 06. I mean, they were good at linebacker in 06. And upon rewatching it, I forgot how big of some of those defensive question marks there were coming into the, to the season because the 05 defense was really good. It was just overlooked because of how bad the offense was in 05. Much like a year after 06, you know, this is – Swain, Meacham, Brett Smith, they're all exiting at the end of the season. So in 07, you've got Lucas Taylor, Josh Briscoe, and, and, and Austin Rogers. Th there were those questions the, fo the following year after this one at wide receiver. But you're right. In this particular year, there were the questions at uh, linebacker. But Mayo was so good. And, 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 and everybody knew he was going to be good. The qu more questions were with Ryan Carl and even Marvin Mitchell. Um, but, you know, Mitchell played good in this game. And, and I think, you know, once Tennessee got the second touchdown and it was a two-score game and the momentum really started to build, you go to halftime, you come out, right out of the half, boom, 21 nothing. And, and at that point, it was over. The, the wave of momentum carried Tennessee in this game, um, you know, and the rest of the way. you start doing the Jordan shoulder shrug? Yeah, that was, that was a little much there, Eric. It's, just one, it's one game. Hang on on that. i tell you who else was a good player in this game, Rob, was Demetrius Morley. You know, when you – I mean, look, he, I mean, he tackled Demo, the sideline, the sideline, and, and Cal never touched him as a punt gu – as a gunner on the punts. I mean, he was fair catching every punt for Cal down there the, the whole entire game. I mean, he was really good against Deshaun Jackson, who's a good punt returner. I, I thought this was a game where Demetrius Morley stood out in an otherwise – pretty whole hum career at Tennessee where not a lot happened for him. I agree. I mean, Hub, I mean, Hubbard, I, I, I know you remember it, AP. I'm sure you do too. I, I remember the night Demetrius Morley committed. It was a Sunday night. I can remember talking to him on the phone. I, I called him on the phone and I, I'm sure he had caller ID and he answered it singing Rocky Top. <laughs> and just, I mean, it was huge. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, enormous. I mean, get the five-star recruit from, from South Florida, Hats off, Trooper Taylor. I don't know. I don't know how you did it. I don't want. I probably don't want to know. And just <laughs> you know, never, never, pant, just, just never did anything. You know, just he. Two kids in this game really jumped out: Demetrius and Lamarcus Coker. When you think, you know, just what might have been with, with those two guys. But I, I thought, I thought Lamarcus was extremely talented, and, and both those guys kind of washed out of the program. And I think they could have. If, if, if the mindset would have been a little bit different as an 18 or 19 year old kid, I think they could have, you know, really been really, really good college players. And Hubbard, to touch on your point, you, you mentioned the linebackers. I just, the defense as a whole, and the, and the announcers talked about it in this game, just the speed. I mean, it, it popped off the screen when you, when you go back and watch it. Just, and, and you know, that's, that's not even, when you think about, you know, Phillips' really good teams in the you know, mid-90s, early 2000s, 
this team isn't isn't even that great when you talk about athletes, guys who went on the league, and it still just jumps off the screen at you. I mean, how much better they are than what we've been seeing over the last 10 years. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan Wade was good in this, and they were just the faster team. I think the other thing that – and we'll talk to Swain about this a little bit in the back end of the podcast here, but, you know, Jesse, Tennessee took this quote. Um, I don't know if Austin Rob remembers this. They took this quote that was on an ESPN.com article back in the summer it may have been Deshaun Jackson who said it, or it may have been one of their corners. I can't remember. Who basically said, hey, we're looking forward to the opportunity to go into Tennessee and kind of show in the country, you know, what Cal football is about. Okay. And Tennessee turned that into the, the, this, this greatest disservice to their program that, you know, Cal was calling them out. They plastered this innocuous quote up all summer long in every locker in in the in the weight room and everywhere else Tennessee was convinced by the time they got there that Cal had zero respect for him in this game absolutely zero respect so Philip Fulmer took the team into the stadium and played them highlights I mean they were pulling out every string everything they could pull out in the summertime to have this team ready to play because Philip Fulmer knew how big of a game this was for him and his program. Well, well they did everything. I mean, much like the Jordan doc, it's, it, it, we've recently learned, you know, however these guys want to motivate, it's, <laughs> you can make stuff up, you can, you know, hold grudges that don't exist, but if you have something that lights that fire, that seems to work. Because clearly the next year, the inverse happened, right? Cal, Cal spent the whole offseason talking about redemption, 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 and, and you know, long, short, who looked like, you know, uh, a, he was not a freshman, but looked played a lot like a freshman in this game, second career game, was much better a season later. They did everything, but uh, Phillip didn't go over there with the – pull the old high school coach move and go there to the stadium and spray paint, you know, Tennessee sucks, <laughs> you know, and say, look what they did. <laughs> but it was – I mean, it was everything under the sun that, that, you, could, that you could see. But th- this was a game – I mean – Look, later on that year, I mean, obviously the ill-fated quarterback sneak uh, or quarterback draw at South Carolina, which resulted in a sprained ankle for Eric Ainge, which prompted Tennessee's kind of limping home at the end of that season um, in, in a crazy play call by David Cutcliffe when, when the game was really over. But that, you know, that changed what happened against LSU in Arkansas later that year. But, but that was a team that was, that was getting better throughout the season. And, and we're going to have a chance to make some noise late until, you know, they were forced to play Crompton against a really good LSU team. He played well and gave Tennessee a chance to win. But, but that Jamarcus was a team. Fumbled. That was a yeah. fumble. That was a fumble by Jamarcus Russell for sure. Uh, but, th- you know, this was a team that kind of just not just calmed down Tennessee fans in this game, but really calmed them down all year long that, hey, they were going to be okay. It was going to be back. The band was back together, so to speak. It didn't stay together long because Cutcliffe headed off to Duke. But, but this was the – Phillips at his best when he has his, his heavy, who was David Cutcliffe. And David was the one who was the bad guy on the coaching staff. He was the one who would go and, and call anybody out that needed to be called out to get things done. And that's why he and Philip Fulmer complimented each other so well in the 90s. And it was apparent here again in 2006 when he returned to Tennessee. You know, I, I tell I, somebody's parent not to call them anymore. Yeah, I remember talking to David. I mean, David did, David did a feature with us, um, you know, on the site in 05. And so I spent a lot of time with David. And, and he was watching the Tennessee, you know, the, all the Tennessee games. We were talking about the SEC and, and Tennessee that year because he was setting out. Uh, because of the heart situation that he had and didn't take the Notre Dame job. It was fascinating to hear him talk about some of the things that bothered him about Tennessee in 05. And it was some of the lack of composure. And, and he felt like Tennessee was sloppy physically, you know, and, and they talked about it in the broadcast. But if you go back and look at 05 compared to 06, those receivers, Jesse, are physically different, significantly different. You know, Tennessee's quicker off the defensive line, and their offensive line, you know, plays more physical in 06 than they did in 05, even though they got a bunch of, you know, younger players playing in there than they had the previous year. Yeah, and, and I mean, again, they, they, they were – this is a game where they, they showcased that speed and the ability to break tackles on multiple – on multiple occasions. And whether Charlie Garner or, or 
uh, Jamal Lewis could actually bench 400 pounds or not. I don't know. But it certainly seemed like whatever offseason stuff worked for Montario. And then, you know, well, I know, I know uh, Foster doesn't have a huge season other than, than the Georgia game actually this year. Um, his big year comes the next season. But, you know, he kind of churned out some yards and got him some first downs uh, when some of those big plays weren't working in this game. So whatever cut had dialed up, it, it certainly came, you know, to what he wanted. It came to fruition for sure in, in, in week one. And favorite, Arian Foster. <laughs> Rob Lewis sitting in his basement with all kinds of chimed ins today. Uh, but, it, it you know, it was a fun game. And it, it was fun to rewatch because Tennessee was really dominant in all facets. I mean, if – I mean, Eric missed – I thought Eric missed two throws really bad. One was the interception across the middle, uh, and then he missed a hole shot. That, that would have been a big play down the sideline. But otherwise, it was, you know, throw it five, six yards and, and let everybody else go make a bunch of plays for you. And uh, they clearly dominated on this game and what was a fun afternoon for Tennessee fans and, and, and set a tone, um, you know, for not just that season, but to kind of announce that they were back and, and kind of had their edge back on them. So – we're going to talk to Jason Swain coming up about his new position coach that season, what he meant to him and Trooper Taylor, as well as David Cutcliffe and what that game meant to this Tennessee team uh, throughout the summer to get ready for the year. That's coming up next here on the Rocky Top Rewind podcast. And remember, if you're in East Tennessee and you need a reliable heating and air system designed for your home and your climate, you need a team that's trained and held to the highest of standards. You need solutions, not sales pitches. There are many heating and air companies in East Tennessee. There's only one name you need to know. That's the veteran-owned, family-operated Blue Water Climate Control. Jeremy and his staff do a fantastic job down there. When you need a new system or a major repair, Blue Water isn't going to send out a salesperson. They're going to send out an expert to your home that can lay out the options uh, and everything that's possible for you. Could be replacing your system, could be repairing your system. Uh, whatever you need, they're going to lay it all out for you to improve your indoor air quality. They have options for financing, uh, which includes same as cash, also rent to own. You can call them today at 865-299-2290 or visit bluewaterclimatecontrol.com to make an appointment. Blue Water Climate Control is an authorized dealer for American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning. For Jesse Simonton, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Stay tuned. Coming up next, Jason Swain joins us to talk about Tennessee's big old win over Cal in 2006. Welcome back to the Rocky Top Rewind podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. Happy to have on the program as we talk about this big win over Cal in 2006. Jason Swain joins us. Jason, thanks for taking the time. I got to ask you, what was the summer like leading up to that game? Uh, it was all about proving everybody wrong. You know, we had – really embarrassed ourselves the year before. You know, we had a talented team and, you know, we did not want to duplicate what happened there in 2005. Um, and being a senior, being someone that, you know, made, made the decision to kind of be one of the leaders, um, you know, we just wanted to prove everybody wrong. Uh, we saw what kind of what happened the previous year and the issues uh, that was there with the team and how we were not able to, to, to reach our goals. And, we just kind of made it a, a, a point to not do the same thing and make the same mistakes. So we just became really, really tighter. Uh, we invested in each other, spent a lot of time with each other. Uh, we held each other accountable. Um, I mean, that, that's, it, was, it was just every attention to detail. Because, you know, you, when you lose six games with that talent, you know, you, know, you start ignoring the small things. And then the small things build up and they become issues, you know. Uh, and so we just really went back to the basics. It was also when Coach Cutcliffe came in. So you had a new new voice for us. And the small things matter, you know, like being five minutes early to meetings or, or you know, not wearing earrings if you were a quarterback or not wearing backwards hats uh, in the building if you were a quarterback. So it just really made us focus on, you know, all the small things. and really made us look in the mirror and, and, and kind of uh, challenge ourselves to be better individually. It started with us first. And uh, it was just a, a summer where we heard all the, the negative comments surrounding Tennessee football and we just want to prove everyone wrong. You go back to that particular game. Can, can you, could you sense, because Tennessee had not had a season like 05 since the 80s. Mm -hmm. Could you sense kind of, an aura 
on the ball walk, uh, you know, a sense of urgency and not, not from just the, the team, but also the fans just wanting to wash 05 out of their mouth and move on to something more normal. Yeah, everybody wanted to wash it out, out of our mouths. I remember in 05, you know, I wasn't a big newspaper guy anyways, but, you know, when Tennessee receivers played well or when I played, had a good game, I like to go and, and look at the grades for the positions. But, you know. Did Griff give you a good grade? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I remember not even wanting to leave the house on, on a Sunday morning. You know, not even wanting to, 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 to wear my Tennessee gear out and about in 2005 because I was just so embarrassed. And I know how much everyone holds Tennessee football to high regard in it. And I just felt like we was in, you know, just kind of letting down the power to all the former players. So it was a really difficult time. Um, just just going outside, man, on a, on a Sunday after a football game, uh, losing those games. So um, ball walks was, 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 wasn't the same. The food in the cafeteria wasn't the same. The air wasn't the same. The water wasn't the same. You know, you, you didn't want to go home during the bye week because you didn't want to be made fun of <laughs> from people back home. You know, it's easy to go home after a bye week when you, when you win the game. But, man, when you lose and you're struggling, you know, you kind of want to be locked up in your own place. So, yeah, man, everything was tough. So, with, with the game itself against Cal, was that more of a release and relief, Jason? Or was that more of a an enjoyable, hey, this is football's fun again, this is what we're supposed to be? Or was it more sort of the – the, the cleansing process, some of that pressure's gone away and, and, and we're on a, on a different plane now or we're on a different level now? I think it was all of it, and, and it kind of hit at different stages during that game. Like, I remember that ball walk and how, like, everyone was laser-focused and couldn't, ready to get, couldn't, couldn't wait to get to the stadium. And the moment we saw the opposing players, you know, it was, it was wartime because we had – we had listened to Marshawn Lynch talk about taking a vacation to Knoxville, you know, on ESPN. You know, they were a top 10 team ranked. You know, they had a lot of NFL talent. And we heard the hype. You know, we were underdog. And so we heard that. Uh, we found it very disrespectful. And we used that as motivation. Uh, you know, we jumped on them pretty early. And when we got up about three or four touchdowns, then it became like relief and it became fun. You know, Montario – uh, touchdown run, you know, there was a brief timeout. I, I don't know if it was a TV timeout or if the team took a timeout, but I remember uh, the quarterback went to the, to the sideline to get the play, and the 10 of us were in the huddle. And we were just talking, cutting up, whatever, and we were like, all right, guys, whatever play we get, let's score on it. Who cares? Let's just let's go score. Let's go score on this play. I don't care what it is. Let's go score. And Montario scored on that play. And we had talked about just scoring on whatever play that was going to be called uh, in the huddle, just having fun. And that was, that was a fun game. So, like, it was a lot of, of what you just mentioned. It was, a, it was this release and then this, there was this relief uh, of having fun. But we understood, like, it was more than just that game. It was about going and trying to win a championship. Uh, we knew we had bigger uh, things um, to, to, to accomplish. We knew that first game of the season, that's when you have – all that correctable film, you know, you make your biggest mistakes and you take your biggest jump from game one to game two. So we knew we were going to get roasted in the meetings from the coaches, but it was fun. You know, it was an electric atmosphere. It was a night game. Um, man, the crowd was unbelievable. It was one of my favorite games. My, my favorite part of that game was when you almost pulled the Deshaun Jackson on your touchdown and, you were like, did I release that ball before I went across the goal line? No, that's not like, what happened. That's yeah, not, yeah, Swain. Go back. That's not what happened. I'll tell you exactly what happened. So so I scored, and I accidentally dropped the ball. Like, I didn't mean to drop it. And I accidentally dropped it. And so I didn't want to look silly dropping the ball on accident because I was going to give it to the ref. But by that point, the ball's on the ground. was rolling, and I was trying to play it off. So I pretended like I was going to the ball and – you know, just looking around. And it was really me trying to play off the fact that I dropped it. And so in meetings, I got in trouble because it looked like I was celebrating, but it really wasn't. It was me trying to pretend like I didn't drop the ball. So from that point on, everyone was ordered that if you score a touchdown, you got to give the ball to the ref. If you don't, you got you got breakfast club or some type of punishment. So that was the sway That's rule. exactly what I thought it was. <laughs> you, you, you 
dropped the ball and then you went to kind of, oh, I better act like I that was on purpose and just keep yeah. running. Yeah, but I I knew I didn't drop it before I crossed the end zone, though. I knew I didn't because you got to think about it. That was the first game of the season. And during fall, cap, fall camp, that's when the team, you know, they laid out, they lay out all these protocols about, you know, don't gamble, uh, you know, don't do this, don't throw out, you know, don't throw your teammates under the bus. And so they show you old Bob Kessling clips of how to do a proper interview. They show you clips of, you know, old, you know, mob member talking about gambling and things like that. So it's like the, it's at the, it's at the, like our awareness is like heightened and we are very alert about those things at the beginning of the season because the coaches have already talked about those things in meeting in fall camp. So absolutely not, man. I, I was not trying to celebrate early and drop the ball like Deshaun Jackson. What happened was I accidentally dropped the ball after I knew I crossed the goal line <laughs> and I was just trying to play it off. So w- were you ever more open than you were on that play on the touchdown? And did you know pre-snap, like, if Ainge will just look, this is this is a this is a walk in. You know what's crazy about that play is like Coach Cut saw that they had trouble with motion from the backfield going to the numbers while having a player lined up in a slot. He saw that from the two thousand and five film on Kyle. So it wasn't like it was the second game of the season, and we saw that in the first game that Cal played. Like, Coach Cut saw that in the offseason. And the fact that we were able to do that and Cal had not kind of self-scouted themselves and fixed that, that just tells you a lot both sides, though, you know, Coach Cut and Cal. But the moment, I mean, it worked exactly like we thought it would in practice. The moment I saw the defense kind of bump out and adjust to Arian Foster uh, going in motion, I saw a wide open, and it was just me simply just making sure I didn't drop a, a wide open catch, because uh, that would have been really embarrassing. So yeah, it was it was it was drawn up perfectly, exactly uh, like we thought it would be open uh, during practice. It was perfect. We we talked about this earlier in the podcast, Jason. Just you know, kind of like new names that had to emerge in that season because you'd lost the talented group of linebackers the year before, and Omar Gaither and Kevin Simon. Yeah. You know, you, you had a guy like Marvin Mitchell step up. Inky, you know, had a pick in this game. And, you know, of course, no one knew what would happen that very next week against Air Force. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it, just just some good guys, you know, on that on that football team. Think about, like, think about Dr. Mayo. That was his coming out party. Mm-hmm. I mean, he came in wearing 53. Like, ugh, who wears 53? <laughs> you know? And then he switched over to seven. And they're like, oh, he seven. looks good. He looks good now, Yeah, right? Yeah, he, he, he wore seven. I want to say he had like two or three sacks in that game. Dude. He did. I mean, he was he was all over the place. I mean, you think about the tone that was set in the opening kickoff. That was Robert Ayers going down and busting a wedge and knocking fools out there on a kickoff coverage team. That set the tone for the entire game. And you think about those guys, those were young pups making plays earlier in their Tennessee career. Those guys went on to be first-round draft picks in the NFL. So, uh yeah, I mean, I think about, like, new guys stepping up. Marvin Mitchell, obviously, has set behind uh, a lot of NFL talent and linebacker. You know, Marvin Mitchell was kind of in that James Banks group. So he had watched Banks, Greg Jones, and others get in trouble and be dismissed. And he made a decision that he didn't want to go down that same path. And he was actually one of our better leaders. Um, that's a really good story about Marvin Mitchell, too. And he went on to be an NFL draft pick and won a Super Bowl with the Saints. Got a second deal with the with the with the Vikings, so uh, a lot of new guys stepped up. You know, Antoine Stewart stepped up as a as a leader. Uh, Turk McBride stepped up as a leader. You know, Paris Harrison was like his his big brother, so he stepped up. Uh, a lot of guys had to because we had a few guys go to the NFL the previous year. Anytime you can get a Greg Jones reference on a podcast, Hubs, it's a good day. Oh, yeah, man. He was, hey, man. Hey, got got that commitment story while he was making a brown bag special at the Sonic. Over in Arkansas, that that's when he <laughs> that's when he committed to the balls. That's my well, nobody, great joke. Nobody story. does that anymore. It's no, stories now are too bland. Everybody's got to have a video, and they got to have all their edits. This guy, literally, he's making a hamburger when I call him up to get the commitment story from him because he's working his shift at the Sonic. Jason, I got to ask you, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not throwing you know, P Dub, Washington under the bus in any way, shape, or form. 
But what was the significance of a new voice in that receiver room with, with Trooper Taylor? Yeah, I mean, things got dull. You know, you had the same coaching staff for so long. And, you know, some of those coaches told me. I mean, I mean, I'm, I remember having a conversation with Pat Washington. Um, and he was like, we got complacent. I mean, he was just a, the most honest comment um, that a coach can tell a player. You know, P-Dub recruited me, too. Uh, him, and, him and Woody McCorvey. So, you know, we had had a, a relationship. And, uh, you know, he just he, he did it for a long time. Man. He had a lot of talented players. Um, tough to kind of maintain that greatness that he that he had at wide receiver for so long. And so, um, you know, a lot of things that we were supposed to do, he wasn't doing. Uh, we, we didn't really pay a lot of attention to the small things. You know, he didn't emphasize the small things as much. And, and Trooper was just kind of what we needed. You know, someone that, that was going to challenge us, um, that held us accountable, that would, got in our face and told us what we what we need to hear, not just exactly what we wanted to hear. Uh, Trooper, Trooper was perfect for what we needed at the time. Um, that energy and, and also that was kind of his passion, the coach, coach wide receiver. And one thing that kind of drove us is that, you know, for my first three years, nobody like – no one really talked about the NFL with the coaching staff. Like, no one was like, hey, you know, we want to get you to the NFL. It was all about, you know, winning games and just doing everything right. But Trooper was like the first coach that was like, yeah, like, I want to help you get to the league. Yeah, we're going to win and do those things. And, you know, winning for Tennessee is important too. But we're going to – we want to help you get to the league because if we help you get to the league, we're going to help you win. We're going to help – you're going to help Tennessee win games too. So, like, that was where the kind of like the buy-in – took off because you had Meacham, who was a junior. You had me and Brett Smith, who was a senior. And, and, and you know, that was exactly what we wanted. We wanted to get to that to that point in our career. So, yeah, Trooper was, was, was perfect for that time. But a lot of things we learned from Pat Washington, we carried over for, to in 06. When, when you look at the – when you look at Ainge in, in that game, how important for you guys, as we kind of wrap it up here, was it for him to have – for you guys to make plays early? Because it was – and I don't want to dwell on 05, but it was up and down. Everybody was, you know, who the quarterback is, who's not. How important out of the gate was it for him to make some plays, for you guys together to make some plays, to, to kind of end all of that and move forward? Yeah, I mean, the year before, it was up and down season at that position. And, uh, you know, he had some good moments, had some bad moments. And, you know, it was – it was really time for us to move forward with one, one quarterback because, you know, 04, we had multiple quarterbacks. 05, we had multiple quarterbacks. And so it was just really time to have one voice. And, um, you know, he had to make plays before people were going to trust him and listen to him. And uh, it was very, very important that that first game of the season happened the way it did because now we knew who the guy was. It was no talk about – uh, you know, Jonathan Crompton or, or some other guy. He was, it was, it was, he was the guy, the quarterback. Uh, and once that happened, I mean, you know, we got off to a good start. You know, Meacham had an unbelievable day. And then, you know, through, through the Georgia game, you know, we were leading the country in yards and receptions as a duo. Uh, had that chemistry rolling and, and Brett Smith was a, was a, was a great uh, part of that. And, you know, we spent a lot of time in, that summer throwing. Uh, with one quarterback, not three or four different ones, but, you know, just one guy that we thought was going to be the starter. And that made all the difference in the world. Well, it was a fun afternoon and night in, in Neyland Stadium, but, and obviously a game where everybody exhaled when they left. It was the Tennessee's back, you know, yeah. and, and that was the feeling there. So um, great memories, and, and thanks for the summertime stories. Thanks for the stories on the game as well. Always great to catch up with you, my man. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Austin Price. Put on your shirt, man. <laughs> Where's your shirt? Put your shirt on. It's the, be it's the best part of this, Wayne, is it's not on video. <laughs> Golly, where's That's your shirt? <laughs> That's going to do it for the Rocky Top Rewind <laughs> podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control.